Hello and welcome to News Click. We're going to discuss with Dr. Satyajit Rath COVID-19 and its other implications in terms of science or what we are learning from the frontiers of medical sciences. Satyajit, today's discussion, let's start with the vaccine issue. Now, it seems that the vaccine is also becoming an electoral ploy in the US elections and Trump wants to sanction use of vaccine before the election campaign really starts. Do you think that is a possibility? And what are the implications of that if that happens? Well, let's look at it this way. Um, there was a ploy to declare a vaccine on the 15th of August, 2020. Um, and that clearly did not work. This your talk of the Indian vaccine yeah. that Modi would announce from the ramparts of the Red Fort, the vaccine. Thankfully, that did not pan out. Um, proper pr procedures are being followed so far. Uh, but certainly, following on from that, as well as following on from their own previous efforts uh, um, at short-circuiting uh, uh, due approval processes, the U.S. Uh, administration has now declared the 3rd of November to be a potential target date. And uh, it's a little bit further away than the 15th of August. Phase 3 trials have already started. So is it within the bounds of possibility that uh, the data might come in time for a rapid but proper procedure to, to, to certify a vaccine, there is an outside chance. It's not a very good chance. But the US FDA and its political uh, masters, as it turns out, uh, have now begun apparently making noises about preparing ground for uh, a short circuit of due process. Okay, so short circuiting due process is already being discussed. So well, that's exactly what an emergency authorization, uh, use authorization is, which is apparently what is being discussed. Okay, okay. The whole point about having an emergency use authorization is that due process for of efficacy for approval has not been gone through in its entirety. This is the hydrochloroquine authorization or the plasma therapy of authorization as well. Correct. So the hydroxychloroquine was um, a... So it's interesting that you bring it up because it's instructive for us to compare and contrast what's going on. So hydroxychloroquine was authorized on two grounds. One, that it was safe because it's already in the market and being used. And two, with no data whatsoever of any rigorous kind, meaning no clinical trial data, that there were anecdotal stories that it might be useful. The emergency use, or use authorization therefore depended on saying, hey, it's safe and it might work. Okay. So at least it satisfied the safety requirement, if not the efficacy requirement. Correct. Now, that's precisely what is apparently being discussed as the basis for an emergency use authorization for what I keep calling candidate vaccines. Okay. Again, it is said, you know, they've already been shown to be safe because they've finished phase one and phase two trials, those trial results have been published, and therefore they're safe. Okay. Whether they work or not, they likely work because they generate neutralizing antibody responses. We'll get a little bit of phase three data that begins to show some differences. That should be enough for an emergency use authorization. So it's been argued that it is safe and therefore there is not so much of a risk. This is the argument. This is, this is the basis. Um, okay. I, I haven't heard the uh, actual FDA personnel being reported as uh, having said anything in, in this much detail. Simply the more, more uh, opaque noises about we are looking at possibilities. Okay. But this is likely to be the basis. What's, inter what's interesting is for us 
to look at the difference between a drug and a vaccine in the context of emergency use authorization. Okay. You give drugs to sick people. That the drug has a long history of being safe, you are giving it to sick people, you're hoping that it will make a difference. If it doesn't make a difference, you are hoping based on its safety profile that it will do no harm, it will have no adverse consequences. Now, at least the safety has been proven. Yeah. Therefore, the risk to sick people is one issue. But here you are giving safety based on phase one and phase two trials to healthy people and that to a much larger number. So it's a, it's a little, you're right, but it's a little more compli complicated than that. And here's the complication. Remember what we said about the drug. We said that if it doesn't work, it won't do any harm. It will have no adverse consequences. So let us ask, is that true of a vaccine that doesn't quite work? Now, this is not simply a matter of safety because let us admit that phase one, phase two trials have been done and therefore the candidate vaccine is safe in terms of the adverse effects. I take the vaccine for the next 15 days or three weeks, all, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy and I have had, apart from a little local pain, apart from a little fever, I have had no ill effects. Is that going to change if it is given under an emergency use authorization? Not likely. But remember what a vaccine does. A vaccine generates an immune response. The immune response, we hope, will last for a substantial period of time. This is very unlike a drug. You want the drug to have an effect while the drug is in the body. That's it. The vaccine has, is designed to create a long-term downstream effect over time. Now, in this context, consider what might happen. Supposing, just supposing, that all is well, the vaccine offers some measure of protection, and that will say that the gamble has worked. But suppose alternatives. Number one, the one alternative is that there will be an immune response. The phase two trial has said that there will be immune responses. So when it's given under an emergency use authorization, there will be an immune response, but that immune response won't protect. Now, it's caused no harm because you say the people who are vaccinated with this emergency authorized vaccine are no worse off than people who are not vaccinated. Not quite. And that's where the difference becomes prominent. In the first place, we know, for example, in India, we are very familiar with the idea that a pre existing immune response to dengue virus can actually enhance Second disease caused by dengue virus. Yeah. This is not. This is not at all uh, to say that I think that's what's going to happen. This is simply to point out that uh, in the immortal phrase, stuff happens. I mean, there's a stronger word than that, but we'll leave it out. But if that is a possibility, then what we would be dealing with is an adverse effect that is generated by an emergency authorized vaccine use in healthy people over a reasonably long term. Now, what? let's sort of break it down a bit. What you're saying is I get the vaccine and it doesn't really give me protection against the infection. I get the infection. Now the reaction of the body actually makes the infection far worse. Is that the, like, like, this is what seems it, to happen in the second dengue infection? This is what happens. The second one in, becomes much more. What is thought to happen in, in, in the dengue example. Kind of a cytokine reaction? Well, it, let's not even get into Entry. how it happens, because in all likelihood, how it happens in dengue is not going to be exactly how it happens in other instances. But the fact is, 
this is this a possibility yes has it been ruled out no what would rule it out the has such a case happened would rule it out has such a case happened in the past with the vaccines for instance not to my knowledge but that's because in the past no vaccine has been authorized through a short circuit remember we said if there's protection well and good if there is just no protection then it's okay it's no worse whereas in the unlikely event that there is exacerbated disease we would be in trouble but that's unlikely you say the most likely thing is that it won't protect after all but that's not all even though it doesn't protect it will have generated an immune response now my body is experienced with a sars cov 2 vaccine and has generated a response in a direction that is apparently not protected this might make me resistant to the effect of an actual vaccine okay okay so if i so get now that i have i i have i have my body has experience with some components of a candidate vaccine and has for whatever reason they ended up making a response that's not protected that's background now on top of this i get a vaccine even a vaccine that actually works but my body may have very different ideas about how to respond in the light of its own previous experience so it will react in that direction much more strongly and therefore the actual protective reaction may not take place and while we do not have really apart from dengue too many examples of exacerbated infection do we have examples of redirected immune responses based on previous experience in truckloads in experimental systems in human systems there are any number of examples where a previous experience with an infection modifies the direction of response to a subsequent immunization so let me summarize it for our viewers so one risk we carry is a dengue like response where the second infection in this case not from the uh, vaccine but from the virus itself could provide a much more serious reaction in the body so that is one that's a risk but you are saying maybe it's not such a big risk but certainly the more known and established risk is that instead of the body's immune system reacting which would not it would normally do because of the vaccine it may direct itself in a different way and that may actually make me more open to infections than would have occurred otherwise have i summarized this for my viewers yes correctly? except that it's it's more that an a, a vaccine that works may not work in these people back and added to that the vaccine that works in other people will not work in this may people. not work in these people you have actually removed the protection possible future protection by giving a un proper not properly tested vaccine now let's let's take this further from science into actual public policy because somebody will say yes but this is what these are all possibilities in the phase 3 clinical trial yes but the phase 3 clinical trial this is precisely the reason why those trials are stringently designed observed supervised and reported whereas authorizing use in the community is a whole different thing altogether you don't even know who's gotten it who's not you're not really keeping stringent track and in terms of public policy what you are effectively doing is you are saying emergency use authorization people can take the vaccine and the result is people who take the vaccine don't think of it as a candidate vaccine with themselves as volunteers in a clinical trial they think of themselves as taking a proven vaccine and therefore their behavior changes and under those circumstances unlike in a phase 3 clinical trial here the chances are that if if it doesn't protect then people who think that they are protected but are not protected will eventually become themselves focuses of infection spread 
And let me add, Satyajit, to what you've said. If a, such an adverse case happens, meaning a failure of a magnitude, which is likely to occur if you do emergency use author, authorization of the vaccine, and it fails, then given the anti-vaccine campaign in the United States, which is apparently about 15 to 20 percent of people there don't believe in vaccine itself. And unfortunately, with the Facebook, we heard about the BJP being an ally of Facebook in India. But we know that Facebook has allied with the anti-vaxxers, not because it believes in, in anti-vaccination philosophy, but because that is the virality of Facebook's algorithm, that they have got huge numbers in the US today who do, do not believe in vaccines. And the social media is a big spreader of this thesis. And unfortunately, I have come across this campaign now in India as well. So this anti-vaccine or anti-vaxxer campaign, as it is being called, is also going to get, gain a huge traction from this and may in fact threaten all our vaccine programs in the future. Just no question about it. You're, 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 you're absolutely right that the uh, irrational anti-vaccine perspective is going to gain ground from an emergency use authorization of a vaccine. In fact, even if the vaccine works, because the propaganda is going to be unproven, untried vaccines are being thrust down people's throats. So, so I think that, the, that, that that possibility is even, even broader. It's particularly a problem because remember that this is a pandemic vaccine, which means that we are, when we get effective vaccines in the plural, as I keep hoping, what we are going to need to do is immunize the population of the world in as short a time as possible. We, we, should, we should have structured plans about how to immunize them. Emergency use authorization does not lend itself to planning for vaccination implementation campaigns. It's, uh, it it becomes me much that. more Let chaotic. me modify that. It, it leads itself to panic planning. It, exactly. This is if complicated even further by the fact that pretty much all of these vaccine candidates that are being tested are not single dose vaccines. Yes. Pretty much all of them will need at least two doses, perhaps more, but at least two doses. Now, more than one dose of a vaccine needs extremely careful, systematic, detailed planning for implementation, even when it's year by year immunization of children in the country. When you are trying to immunize the population of the world in structured, carefully targeted and prioritized global basis, which is how we should be doing it across the world, two doses actually hugely amplify the operational difficulties involved. You know, Satyajit, it's also clear that we are moving into magic remedies in the realm of at least policy, that we think there's a magic bullet, which will all be authorized by Mr. Trump, just as he forced the FDA to authorize hydrochloroquine and thinking that that's a magic bullet. Now, of course, it's not that he's, in, uh, he's alone in this. Uh, there is also the Russian vaccine, which you have criticized earlier, but at least they had said first of in somewhere in January that it will be available for mass use. But here we are talking of really November, which is 3rd of November, which is much earlier than that. But more than that, it does appear that the world over, 15th of August, India's case was the earlier one that we criticized here, that we are really not talking of public health policy. We are really talking of magical remedies in, in this sense that it will come from somewhere, this is the silver bullet, it will solve all our problems, life will again become hunky-dory. We are not thinking that this is a watershed moment and it might, might need to change our policies and our behavior for at least foreseeable future. It's completely consistent 
What we are seeing masquerading as public policy across the world is completely consistent with the logic of rapacious capitalism. Okay. There is no disaster that you cannot turn a profit from. Disaster capitalism, as uh, Naomi Klein put it. So this is disaster capitalism on the basis of a pandemic. And, yeah. and it's, how the, it's how the states of the world are responding. In public policy, from the perspective of what is effectively the spirit of disaster capitalism. That's an interesting point to keep in mind that disaster capitalism, like all capitalism, is willing to turn a quick penny and is not really bothered about the long-term consequence of what happens. And this is exactly now the case when you want to turn a quick buck and also think politically a quick buck, that political capital quick. Oh, capital. That's what I meant when I said the spirit of disaster capitalism is, is, is masquerading as public policy of right-wing governments. Thanks, Satyajit, for being with us, talking about the vaccine issue which I think increasingly is going to be the focus of our discussions in the future, because it also brings together complicated science. And we have already argued that immune systems are complicated and therefore vaccines are obviously also complicated and also public health policies and what we need to do. Unfortunately, the first prey of the pandemic has been the public health policies and we are really looking for solutions which are somehow politically going to satisfy the bosses. But unfortunately, viruses don't seem to understand this and that's going to be our problem. And the people, how they respond is going to decide what's going to happen in the future. Thank you very much for being with us and our viewers. Thank you for being with us and do keep watching news click videos and also visit our website.